Hello and welcome back to East Coast Amusements. In this mini-series, I'm covering all of the parks that I visited on my East Coast coaster road trip in the summer of 2022. The last video covered Kings Dominion, the Cedar Fair amusement park located in Doswell, Virginia. Now it's time to head about an hour southeast to one of my favorite parks of the trip, Busch Gardens Williamsburg. With Busch Gardens Tampa being one of my home parks, I was very eager to knock this park off my bucket list. Not only were the coasters great, but the vibes of this park were simply immaculate and it turned out to be, in my opinion, the best day of the trip. So let's get right into it. As we pulled into the line for the parking tolls, we got a very nice view of Apollo's Chariot, which really got us amped up for the day seeing a nice tall B&M Hyper in the trees. Being a Florida Platinum Pass holder, I didn't think my benefits would work at BGW, but I was pleasantly surprised when the attendant gave me preferred parking. We made our way into the park and I distinctly remember how pretty the park was from the very beginning. We got right into the park with no real weight at the entrance and hit the ground running with the coasters. Considering we were both big B&M Hyper fans and clamshell stands, it was a no-brainer that we started off our day with Apollo's Chariot. We waited about 20 minutes for the front row as I figured with the coaster being set in the woods, the views are going to be ideal from there. The views did not disappoint, but unfortunately that was probably the only thing that didn't disappoint. Not sure if it was because we were in the front row, the fact that it was a morning ride, or maybe the fact that it was just B&M's first go at the model, but I got like no air time. It was a fun ride, but you could just tell that it doesn't hold up to rides like Mako or Diamondback. Walked away disappointed, but I knew I'd come back later for a back row ride. After Apollo's Chariot, we knew we needed to get on something that had a little bit more oomph to it. Pantheon was the most anticipated ride, and it only had about a 20 minute wait, so we decided to give it a go. The ride itself was pretty epic. I love the Zero-G Winder, the Top Hat, the Spike, the Outer Banked Airtime Hill, and even the Zero-G Stall. However, what absolutely made this ride for me was the airtime I got on that backwards launch heading into the Spike. I don't know what Intamin did, but that airtime moment is just so aggressive for no reason, and it's easily one of the strongest moments of airtime I've ever experienced. I walked away from Pantheon blown away. And before you ask, no it is not better than Velocicoaster, not even close. But Velocicoaster is a different animal altogether, so that's an unfair comparison. I knew I needed to come back later for a back row ride, but from there we headed towards a restaurant called Trapper Smokehouse to grab some food before we hit up Invader. Invader was a cute little GCI that had some bite to it, some nice pops of airtime and some typical GCI twists and turns, but nothing too crazy. After Invader, we headed over to Griffin. It was nothing to lose your mind over, but it did become my favorite dive coaster that day. I loved how beautiful the view was from the top, and I thought the second drop setting on the river was stunning. I also got the weirdest pop of airtime in the section just after the splashdown before heading into the final breaks, and it caught me completely off guard. From Griffin, we went to go check on Alpengeist, as it had been having problems all day and we wanted to give it a go. When we walked up to the entrance, the ride was cycling with guests, but when we made it into the station, it went back down. We decided to wait it out since all the other waits in the park were starting to get a little longer, and we figured we would be the first ones on when it reopened. Luckily for us, only about 15 minutes passed before trains were cycling with guests again. We hopped in the front row, and Alpengeist did not disappoint. The coaster was packed with some intense positives, especially during the Immelman and Cobra Roll. It's still not better than Montu or Afterburn for me, but it's a great invert nonetheless. After Alpengeist, we kinda just perused the park. We checked out the shops, which had some really cool merch, as well as checked out some of the animals like the wolves and the birds. It was really nice to be able to just take it all in, as we weren't on a time crunch or didn't really feel rushed during this day. We eventually found the entrance to Loch Ness Monster, which I kinda forgot existed in the park. Which, shame on me for doing so, because Nessie is an elite era. I loved how beautiful the coaster was, and I was really impressed with how smooth and intense it was for an over 40 year old roller coaster. I'm not sure if I prefer Magnum or Nessie, but I know for a fact that this coaster is an icon and it will always hold a special place in my heart. It was getting kinda close to sunset time, and I wanted to make sure I got plenty of footage of the coasters, so we headed down to the river walkway where I got some awesome shots of Nessie, Alpi, and Griffin. Just being surrounded by those three coasters on all sides was honestly so surreal. On our walk, we ran into Verbolton's final drop, which totally reminded me that we needed to head over there sooner rather than later. We got to Verbolton and saw that it had a 45 minute wait. We decided to bite the bullet and just wait it out. Luckily it was only actually about 30 minutes, so big shout out to the Verbolton crew for pumping out trains that day. The coaster itself was a big surprise if I'm being completely honest. I thought it was going to be off-brand Hagrid's, and it turned out to be so much better than I thought. I loved the launches and the indoor section felt so out of control. 
The drop track did feel a little bit shorter and weaker than Hagrid's, but it was still a nice surprise not knowing when it was coming, and the drop over the river was really cool too. Overall, I thought Verbolan was just a very fun coaster, and a number two in the park for me. After Verbolan, we booked it over to Apollo's Chariot to get a nice near sunset ride in the back row, which I thought was much better, but still not all that great. I had completely forgotten about Tempesto, but luckily it was a walk-on so we decided to stop and get the credit. We finished out the day with a back row sunset ride on Pantheon, which was awesome. The spike and top hat were intensified, and the inversions felt a little bit more whippier in the back row, which was nice. After Pantheon, we noticed that the train was pulling in, so we booked it down to the station to make it just in time to catch it. Our feet were killing us, and we really didn't want to have to walk all the way back to the front of the park, so the train was a lifesaver. We enjoyed a nice peaceful ride on the train as we made our way back towards the exit. Of all the parks of the trip, this was the one I was saddest to leave. I enjoyed my time at Busch Gardens Williamsburg so much. Like, the whole time, I was just like, can we just trade Busch Gardens? Don't get me wrong, I do love Busch Gardens Tampa, and I wouldn't trade Iron Gwazi for the world. But the setting and the vibes at BGW were just so immaculate, and I can't put into words how much I love the park's atmosphere as a whole. I think partially, BGW reminded me of Epcot and the World Showcase, how all the countries are kind of represented. So like, take Epcot and put some coasters in it and call it Bush. Anyway, I say all of this to say that I love my time at BGW and I can't wait to get back to the park. I'm not sure if I'll make it in 2023, especially if they announce their 2024 coaster to be something absolutely massive. I guess time will tell, but rest assured I will be back to this park. The final ride counts are as follows. 2 on Pantheon, 2 on Apollo's Chariot, 1 on Alpengeist, 1 on Griffin, 1 on Verbolton, 1 on Tempesto, 1 on Loch Ness Monster, and 1 on Invader. Unfortunately, we missed out on the Grover cred, but maybe I'll stop and get it next time. So what are your thoughts on Busch Gardens Williamsburg? Is this the best park in Virginia? Do you prefer this one or Busch Gardens Tampa? Do you think it deserves all the praise that I'm giving it? Let me know down in the comments. This series is nearly complete, with the next episode covering my time at Carowinds, which is an awesome day of the trip as well, so stay tuned for that video coming out in the future. With that, I'm Sean from East Coast Amusements, and I'll see you guys in the next one.